the next guest I have up today is someone who I am thrilled to talk to. Um, I, I did not learn about her book, The Good Fight, until after I had published mine, but it turns out that we are simpatico. We have a lot of the same ideas. Leanne Davey, thank you so much for coming on to uh, my Lovable Leader launch event. And let me just say, I absolutely love your book. I bought the audio book and I just finished it up and I loved it so much that I'm buying uh, either the Kindle or paperback. I'm deciding which because I have to, I have to go back through it because it was, it was, there's just so much, we have so much in, in to talk about. So thank you for coming today. Okay. Don't do that. Just, just send me your address and I'll send you a nice hard copy. So I'm don't like, hard cover. You get like, come on, don't be silly. All right. Yeah. Oh my God. Come on. Let's talk you about heard it. Jess. Oh, it's gotta be signed. It's gotta be like, come on. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Amazing. Okay, um, we have, we have so much to talk about today. So much. We do. Um, so today you and I are talking about, um, we're talking about, um, um, conflict resolution, but this is under, uh, the, the category of really productive conflict. It's what your book is about, which is absolutely incredible. So funny story. I think I told you this. I love funny using... story about conflict. I love funny stories. It's fun, right? Conflict. No, but I had been using the term productive conflict for several years and I brought it up to someone that's in our mutual circle and they were like, Oh, Leanne Davies book. And I was like, huh? So I had been using this term and it turns out you have an entire like book dissertation full of like the most, by the way, it might be the most tactical book I've ever read in my life. The examples in it, I immediately turned to my wife. She's always telling me to give more examples, more stories. And I was like, oh, well, you should just read Leanne's book. It's, uh, it's perfect. Um, <laughs> so, but you. we, we have said there were several topics in there and there's actually one in there. I don't know if you tuned in earlier, but I shared what I think is the most important framework in my book. And it is called, I, I'm not lying, sit Drum on roll. the same side of the table. Yes. And you literally, and literally have it in your book. Literally, and I literally. was like, what is happening? Great minds think yeah. alike. Great minds yeah. think alike. You know what? I said that to my daughter when she was little. I think she was like seven at the time. I said, well, you know, great minds think alike. And she goes, no, they don't, mummy. <laughs> and I was like, oh, <laughs> damn. Well, all right. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll let us off with it in this case. Yeah, it's very funny. My friend Colin Hunter, um, who has this great book called Be More Wrong. And you know what? He launched a podcast around Be More Wrong. And guess who he thought of to have for the first season? Who, who could be wrong more often than me? So that always makes me laugh. But yesterday, <laughs> he and I were having a conversation about benches and how important benches are as places to have conversations that kind of open up and have hard conversations. And he didn't realize it because he doesn't have the same, he's not a psychology nerd like me, but um, benches are great because uh, we take away the eye contact, we bring down the emotional intensity, and we can have conversations that we wouldn't have when we're across a desk or across a table and kind of looking at each other. It's one of the things that makes all this two years of Zoom so hard is we're looking straight into people's eyes and we're yep. also at a distance that says to the brain, alert, like scary, they're in my space. So um, I'm about all about same side of the desk or if possible on a bench, uh, yes. whatever you can do. So, yep. Absolutely. I was thinking of it like and, a booth and we have so much yeah. baggage around this too. Like I, when you were saying it, like, you know, staring out of eye in it and when you're sitting next to each other, it reduces the um, sort of like the emotional intensity. I was thinking yeah. part of that is our emotional associations to those scenarios, right? So when, the, when I was uh, going through the design process of the book, uh, the designers were presenting all of these options of two chairs on the same side of a table. And one of them, yeah. it was a table that um, the chairs were facing like the viewer and the, t so it yeah. looked like a courtroom. And I was like, Oh no, 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 that, that's not what we're looking for. Right. You can't handle the truth. Exactly. Yeah, right. <laughs> so it had this like really aggressive yeah. feel to it. So I, I guess my point of that is like this whole idea of what, how do you think of it when you're sitting in a booth with someone or when you're sitting on a yeah. bench next to someone, like it doesn't feel the same way as when you're sitting across from somebody at a table like you're like you're you know uh you're about to be interrogated or you're about to be interviewed those are all very high intensity so i really like yeah. that you you had that same thought to you 
Yeah. And the other thing, just if there's any parents listening, um, I'm on the board of this wonderful children's mental health organization called Strong Minds, Strong Kids. And we recommend this to parents. Uh, one of the reasons that extracurricular activities are so great with your kids is because you can go pick them up in the dark at nine o'clock. They're in the back seat and you have that 10 minute drive where it's a place to say the things they might not say with, with that face to face and more intensity. So uh, it works as a parenting technique. It works in relationships. It works, um, in, uh, if you're a boss and, a and a direct report, if your coworkers, you know, get side by side, face the same direction, have those bench conversations. I love it. And just a quick personal anecdote. When my dad wanted to have the talk with me when I was a teenager, <laughs> he brought me on a run. We went to a track and we went for a run around the track. Now, mind you, I was in probably better shape than I am now. I was playing basketball a lot and he was in pretty decent shape, but it, it actually helped to make what could otherwise be a slightly more awkward conversation, much less awkward because yep. we were just on a run. We were just next to each other. And it wasn't like the like, so let me talk to you about it. It wasn't this whole thing. It was very, it was very casual. See, your dad could have written our books. I'm not sure about that, but he definitely inspired part of mine. Okay, good. good. So here's where I want to start because okay. you use this term. I use this term and I want to set the context for people. What do you mean when you say productive conflict? Yeah. Conflict that, that gets you somewhere somewhere Sweet. preferably yeah like that's it right so it's right in the unproductive word. yeah unproductive conflict is just so much about we're going around in circles we're wearing each other down <laughs> we're not creating a breakthrough we're not getting past this we're going to come back to it over and over again all of that's unproductive productive conflict leaves the business in a better place it leaves your relationship in a better place and it leaves you in it, less stressed out and in a better place that's productive conflict i love it because i and when i um when I think about the term productive conflict, I often think so often we're fearful of having the conversation in the first place. So nothing gets done. So then we feel anxious because nothing's moving along. There's no resolution to a thing. And is, isn't is that one of the things that you call conflict debt? That's what I call conflict debt. So I needed a term for this. I felt like if we had a term for it, then yeah. we could talk about it. Um, and so what came to mind was this story. I don't know how many people have toll highways in their hometowns, but uh, we have a big, I live in Toronto. We have a big toll highway and I live right in the middle of the city. So I don't need to use the toll highway very often because it's kind of out of my way. But one time I was going to a client and, and I thought, I'm going to take this toll highway. And so they take a picture of your license plate and they they send you the bill and so i got the bill for like seven dollars but it was like in olden days when you had to find a, a check like a paper check and you had to what, find an envelope a and a stamp but i know yeah. so long story short a year and a half later i paid 132 dollars <laughs> to a collections agency for the oh <laughs> for the privilege of riding um, a few miles on that toll highway. Anyway, so I think of conflict the same way. So you're you're on a Zoom meeting with a teammate, you're just about to start your presentation and uh, they turn off their camera. And in your head, you're telling yourself this whole story about, oh, like, you know, isn't she so cool? Doesn't need to watch my presentation or doesn't like my stuff or isn't engaged. We come up with this whole story might have absolutely no relationship to the truth. But then the next in the afternoon, uh, she she sends you an email and you're like, mm -hmm, sure, miss, good enough, not or too good for my my presentation. And you respond to her email differently. And then she who thinks everything is fine because she only turned off uh, her video because the cat kept, kept sticking its butt in the camera. Um, <laughs> she thinks everything's fine. Now all of a sudden she gets this nasty email from you. She's like, what's this about? And so in the meeting two days later, she's a little icy and the whole thing goes downhill. Well, that's just like my $7, $7 issue that turned into $132. If in the moment you just said, Hey, can I grab you for a minute after the call? Hey, what was going on when you turned off your camera? But we don't, we get into conflict debt. And so that next email comes in and $7 becomes $20. And then we go to the meeting and $20 becomes $75. And then there's some huge issue that maybe affects the customer or affects a project, all because we were in this conflict debt. So you can have great fun with this metaphor. I have a good friend, wonderful guy, and he'd been in debt with his wife about an issue for two years. And I said, you need to cut up your card. <laughs> You need to deal with this stuff when it comes up. And he called me from the car and he said, we didn't have a very good morning 
and I walked out of the house without dealing with it. But I called her from the car and said, we need to talk about it tonight. Is it okay if I just make a minimum payment on the card? I'm like, yes, <laughs> you can you can have fun. But uh, you know the the metaphor really resonates with me because my first job I ended up getting into so much conflict at that I declared bankruptcy. That is, I I quit because I yeah. didn't know how to get out of it. So yeah, that's conflict debt. And as soon as I say it, most people I just sort of see them kind of like, uh, oh, like <laughs> everybody recognizes. There's probably a few places in life that they're. They're in a little conflict debt. Yeah. And you know, it's <laughs> funny. I've found, so I'm not one who's generally reluctant to engage in a confrontation over something. And, and, and I think partly these words are loaded, conflict, confrontation, uh, collision, any of these words about two things smashing together, it seems like it's going to be this violent outcome. But often it, it can just be a very simple addressing something so it doesn't fester and build and become something awful. Um, but I've never been one to really shy away from these things. And I've found that as I've more proactively tried to resolve things in the moment or kind of force that that conflict to res to get to a resolution, I've felt a lot less stress and anxiety in my life about things left kind of open loops, left out hanging. But that said, I also feel like I have um, a, a pretty decent handle on how to have difficult conversations, how to have great conversations. And those are things that I think make me more confident going into it. Do you think that a lot of the reasons why people avoid conflict is because they don't feel like they have the tools to necessarily engage in that conversation without potentially making it worse. Because it's sort of like, let's say you have the, the conflict debt and yeah. you're like, okay, I'm going to take care of this conflict debt. But then you decide to switch to a higher interest card by having that conversation. You know what I mean? Exactly. So, so yeah. you know, you've been in this and, and dealing with clients across the spectrum. What have you seen has been the major roadblock? Because it makes sense logically that you want to engage in this conflict to yeah. be able to get to a resolution. Yeah. So that makes sense logically. So I'm going to back us up one step. So I have seen very large organizations spend millions of dollars training people on conflict skills. There are amazing conflict skill programs out there on the market. And I've seen companies who take 50,000 employees and put them all through it. And I see zero change in their uh, willingness to have productive conflict. So let's step one step Starting. back. Yeah. It, Yes. Although not for me. I'm like, okay, <laughs> you got any money left? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Did I just say that live recorded? It's okay. Or, it's okay. Um, I made the money uh, signs. So really mine was more uncouth than yours. <laughs> so basically the one step back is, you know, humans, this is one of the coolest things I just learned recently. Somebody asked the anthropologist Margaret Mead for what was her first evidence that humans adapted evolutionarily as um, cooperative uh, creatures. And, you know, most people would think it would be various things around a campfire, or those sorts of things. And she said, no, the first evidence we have of humans as being very collaborative creatures is we have a very, very, very old femur leg bone that shows evidence it was broken and then it healed. And, and what's interesting and exciting about that is any other animal in the animal kingdom, if your femur breaks, you die because you can't get away from predators. You can't get food. But the fact that there was a human who had lived a long life after breaking their femur suggested somebody protected them and somebody fed them. So that was her. For, and I thought, OK, that's how many thousands of years of biology we have that make us collaborative, cooperative community creatures. So let's start with a little empathy for the fact that conflict doesn't come naturally, because if we were the ones who got into fights, or if our ancestors were the ones that got into fights, they got shoved out of the cave and eaten by the tiger. So not many of us had, had ancestors who were very good at conflict. So we start there. Secondly, we're socialized to believe that conflict is unprofessional, impolite, unladylike. So there's a lot going on before we get to the skills issue which is that our, our mindset around conflict is that it's it's being a poor team player, that it's not how we're supposed to show up, and we need to change that first. But because that's how we're raised, because of that, we don't learn conflict skills in school. 
right? We don't learn conflict skills as a kid. We have some behavior that immediately gets called bullying. Everybody gets sent to the principal's office. Mothers are freaking out and picking up their kids and changing their schools and all sorts of stuff. We don't learn that conflict is a natural, normal part of relationships and we need some skills for dealing with it. So then we don't have the skills and then we're in the position you're talking about, which is I, I kind of now believe I need to have this conversation. I don't know how to do it without you know, sounding horrible or making the person cry or getting them defensive. So yeah, skills is an issue. I just don't want to, yeah, Erica, I know I wish we did too, because this children's mental health charity, I'm always saying we need to give kids these relationship skills like productive, productive conflict. Because when you're 25 and entering the workforce, that's not the first time you want to ever be learning how to do this. We want it yeah. a lot sooner. So I'm with you on skills, Jeff. I really, really am. I just, you know, I've seen companies spend fortunes building skills, but it's like we bought everybody the most gorgeous screwdriver, but if they just leave it in the toolbox because they think it's, you know, not right to use a screwdriver, then it's not, it's not really helpful. So we need both. We need to change the mindset first, tackle all the baggage we have about conflict, then we can build the skill set. And then you know, beyond that, we can talk more about how that's not enough either. We got to get to habit. Oh, we'll get to that for sure. <laughs> I, I, have, I have I have I have another thing I got to throw in there because okay. as you're talking about it, I'm thinking, well, one, yes, culturally, there's a stigma against conflict. We don't want to do it. It's rude. It's this. We have a lot of baggage around it. Definitely one yep. thing. I want to ask you about another element that I think may be contributing specifically as it relates to teamwork at work. And potentially, yeah. I think on other types of teams, maybe in sports and such, but I think mostly in the business environment is the element of competition and how yeah. that actually plays a factor. Because, it, you know, I think about people on a team, the element of competition over scarce resources like promotions or, you know, um, the, the boss's attention or anything like that could put us in a position where there is conflict, but it's unproductive. Or if there is something that could resolve and, and make the team in a better place, people avoid it because by by making amends with that person, you're no longer in a position where you may be able to beat them in a competition. Now you're in a cooperative mindset. So can you talk a little bit about how you've seen cooper or sorry, competition factor in as an as an element in why we struggle with adopting productive conflict as a as a remedy? Yeah, and I think it's because the very um white male version of business and the world was a was a zero sum game model. Yeah. right? A scarcity mentality, an upper out, uh, like all of those sorts of things. And it's false. <laughs> you know, There is so much opportunity in our world that leaders who bring that scarcity mentality do their businesses a disservice, not just all of their people. So it, it's a terrible thing. There, there's an interesting um, longitudinal research study by Morton Hansen that says, you know, we are talking a great game in our organizations about collaboration and about cross-functional this and that. And, and if you look at who actually gets ahead, it's the people who ignore everybody else and, and you know, just make their own boss look good. And, and so, it, you know, all this stuff we're saying about collaboration is crap. If our measurement systems, if our reward systems are only rewarding the people who throw everybody else under the bus. So it's really important that we move past that. You know, innovation depends on us being better at conflict, better at collaboration. Risk mitigation requires that we're better at bringing the diverse perspectives of different people. So I agree with you. I think that's been the model. I think that model, and, and interestingly, as we see the rise of other cultures and other countries in business, they don't have those same very North American, very Western models. They have um, communal models, community models, like very different. Yep. They might just eat our lunch if uh, if we don't figure this out. So well, it's yeah. I mean it's classic game theory, right? Like if you're in a competitive environment, you know the the competition wins in the game theory. Where whereas the best outcome overall is actually cooperation. So um, exactly. I'm I'm 100 in in the camp of that. <laughs> I want to go back to what you just said though, uh, or where you were going to take it, which is about habits. Because when yeah. you said it, you know you give everybody the best screwdriver, but they put it in the drawer, it doesn't work. That to me sounded like well. 
providing them with the solution or the training might not be the answer. How do you make it real and have it? How do you give them things to start screwing in, let's say, with their fabulous brand new screwdriver? That's what we need, more screwing. You know, <laughs> more screwing in at business, right? <laughs> anyway, so the, the the point being is you were about to talk about habits and that's, that's yeah. definitely where my mind was. How do you make this yeah. a real thing that happens on a regular basis? How do you make it safe for that? What, what's yeah. the starting points? And um, and keep in mind that the book, Lovable Leader, is for new managers. So um, I want to always keep in mind that that's who I'm talking to here yeah. and who we're trying to, to talk to is, you know, you're brand new in this role. You just got put into it. How do you make productive conflict a part of your, your own way of working and your team? Yeah. So what I want you to think about, new manager, is I, I want you to think the way you've been raised is that conflict is an event. Now I want you to shift to saying, what if con conflict could be a habit? And the simple way that people resonate most with this is to say, we want conflict to be like flossing, not like root canal. <laughs> ah, so yes. does that, and, and as soon as I say that, do you go like, okay, what's my daily dose of yeah. flossing? A little bit of productive conflict. So no I one never likes it, but it's good for your gums. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it's not that aversive. Like, you know, I notice that if I, if I don't get ready for bed, sort of an hour before bed when I'm before I'm going to read and things like that. I don't love to floss when I'm really sleepy. But if I'm on top of things and I'm, you know, doing it at nine o'clock instead of 10, it's all good, right? Well, the well that's same also is good true. because of the conflict debt model that you propose. Because yeah. if you don't floss for a year and a half, that flossing is going to be really not fun. But if you do it regularly, yeah. no big There's deal. There's going to be blood. There yeah. is going to be blood. It's yeah. going to be no it's good. Exactly. So, and there's probably a root canal in your future. Yes. So, um, so what I do, um, and I publish this exercise in the Harvard Business Review, if it's useful to people, it's, you can find it online, helping your team with more productive conflict is new manager into your team. And what you want to do is you want to do an exercise where for every role on your team, you want to have people together, do it together as a team exercise, answer three questions. First question, what is the unique value of your role? What expertise, what experience, what do we count on you to bring? What kind of diversity of thought do we count on you to bring to our conversations? So sales is saying things like, well, you know, I'm really coming at this thinking about how we differentiate from the competition and, you know, these sorts of things. Well, operations is saying, I'm really thinking about efficiency. Great. Okay, question number two, what stakeholders are you advocating for and how are those stakeholders different? Don't focus on the ones that are the same. Everybody's like the customer. That's not very helpful. But when all of a sudden you realize that some of the people around the table are thinking about the customer as the buyer, maybe that's procurement or the, the signing authority, and others are thinking about the customer as the user or the consumer, you realize, oh, well, these are very different perspectives we have uh, if one of us is thinking about a buyer and one's thinking about a user. Okay, it's useful to know that. And no wonder we're feeling all this tension in our conversations because the buyer and the user are often, the buyer's like, just get me something cheap and cheerful. And the user's like, this UX sucks, right? So it's often in tension. So when you can understand, and when you understand the finance person is thinking about the regulator and whomever, you start to go, Oh, no wonder they're often disagreeing with me or saying something different. And then the final question is the big one, which is, so what is each role's obligation to conflict? What are they obliged? What tension are they obliged to put on our conversations? Hmm. So that the salesperson is obliged to say, you know, is it, is it, you know, appealing? Is it compelling? Is it differentiated? Well, the ops person is obliged to say, is it standardized? Is it efficient? Is it scalable? And all of a sudden, when you get to the end of this exercise, it's often a little quiet for a bit while everyone's like, oh, <laughs> and all of a sudden they realize. So it's supposed to feel tense in here sometimes. And then we, for new managers, I really want you to listen to this. Then you realize that your role is not to be pulling on any one of those ropes, but instead to be helping come to the optimal decision taking all of those factors into consideration and, and helping people understand, you know, how do those tensions need to shift based on what's changing in the world? What's more or less important? If, if we have to compromise on one of those things, which is the one where we can afford to take a little risk and where can we not? So as a manager, you know, thinking about it, not as I'm in the tug of war, but thinking about it as, you know, I kind of own the whole thing and I'm trying to make sure we, we get the optimal decision. This exercise, it is kooky. 
see how after doing this exercise, teams just feel so much more liberated. So if you go around and you do the, that wheel on all these decisions you're making, like flossing, everybody just gets so accustomed to it. And it's it's just so much easier and no root canal required. I love it. And it, you know, it makes me, uh, as you were describing that, and, and when you first kind of laid out the sales and the operations, I pictured the the leader's job of kind of sitting in between and sometimes playing translator, right? Saying like, this Often. is what this this stakeholder or, or this group and what their goals are, and this is what yours are. Let's find the alignment between those two and figure out how we can support each other. And yeah. kind of being able, like a you know, a conductor basically, choosing where you're going to be diverting your attention and and aligning everyone around that in the you know at the time that needs to happen. So I completely get that metaphor and I understand that exercise and why it would be so impactful and powerful. You said that's an HBR article. Yeah. Okay, cool. I'm gonna try and uh, I have we have a break coming up after uh, your session. I'm gonna go and grab that and throw it in the chat for everyone so that they can go and find that article. Um, that's awesome. going to be really useful. Thank you. Um, <laughs> your welcome. book is so full of um, conversation templates, um, uh, frameworks for different types of conversations, uh, models for assessment. It's really, it's it's an incredible and invaluable guide that I think every new manager who's tuning into this should go and pick up. Um, but um, I know we don't have time to go through too, too many of any of those, but could you just quickly, very briefly touch on what is the you? Just a teaser so that people... <laughs> Could pretend, because it's even hard to think about without seeing like the graphic and going through it. But can you talk just real quickly? Do you about know it? the Miami the Hurricanes? The Miami Hurricanes logo. Picture that. Yeah. If you, if you know that logo of the U. Yeah. Um, okay. So what it is um, is it's the first big tool I share in the book, which is one of those creating healthy habits tools. And it comes from the idea that so much conflict we have in organizations is we because we do a terrible job of sharing our expectations and setting people up for success. When we do a terrible job of setting people up for success and they then disappoint us, then we get into a lot of conflict on all sorts of sides. Um, it is nearing Valentine's Day. So let me say in the book, I refer to this as the Valentine's Day effect, where we hold an expectation of someone, but fail to communicate that expectation and, and merely wait for them to disappoint us. But they so should just you, know. If Yeah. Yeah. No, that does not work. I've been married 25 years. That does not <laughs> that work. That does not work. Um, if, if there is something you imagine for what someone could do on Valentine's Day to show their undying love and affection for you, I suggest you communicate it to them. Yeah. So the you, um, the you does a couple of things. It's It looks at what's the unique value I need to add to position people to succeed. So it looks at different levels. It says, and what do I need from the level above me so that I can add my value and, and what do I need to delegate and expect of the level below? So that's the first thing The you is separated into like a, like a macchiato. It's got like the foam and the, and the Man, milk and the, and the coffee. Yes. Yeah. Um, it's got those levels. And then the reason it's a you is because so much of what creates conflict is we add value after someone has done the work. Uh, so I always say if somebody's baked these beautiful carrot zucchini muffins and afterwards you come and say, ew, carrot zucchini muffins, and you start shoving chocolate chips into their muffin. That's what we do with people. We don't set clear expectations about what we want from them. And then after the fact, we poke at their work and and kind of tear it apart. So this the you has two halves because we want to talk about how do we add more value up front before they start baking, before they buy any ingredients as opposed to shoving chocolate chips in the muffins once they're baked. So that tool, it's another one. It's in the book, chapter seven, and it takes you through everything you need to do this exercise with your team to say, how does every level in our department set everybody else up for success? And how do we do it proactively so we avoid those fights that are, that's unproductive conflict, right? That that yes. chocolate chips in the muffins conflict. I'm just picturing <laughs> that right pretty. now and- Carrot zucchini muffins sound delicious. I think chocolate would ruin it. <laughs> so yeah, I nice totally get it. Auto. Yeah. And it robs people of their ownership, right? So yeah. like, you know, one of the things I talk about in the book is like, you know, a good leader doesn't take credit for their team's success. And they also, uh, they don't point blame when things don't work. They own the blame and they own the the results not coming through and they never take credit for their team's success. And I think in the same way, somebody comes to you with those beautiful muffins, you start shoving chocolate chips in. What is their what is their motivation next time to bring something to that bake sale? They're just going to bring you some Entenmann's yeah. in a box. That's all you got. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Here, here, you get a box of the powdered sugar because yeah. 
That's it, like it. it just it cost me too much last time to go to all that effort to be invested to care about this to slave over it forget it yeah completely well i want to uh first thank you for coming on and supporting the book launch sharing yeah, your brilliance yeah, um, yeah and and i i really can't encourage people enough to go pick up your book i am um, i'm only embarrassed that it took me so long to read it um because it's really really fantastic so i want to end on the last question that i've been asking every guest okay. which is when i say the the words lovable leader uh, mm -hmm. I'm curious if anybody comes to mind from your past or from your present, and if you could share a little bit why any of those people might come to mind for you. Yeah, I guess the person who really comes to mind first for me is a former coworker. Uh, her name is Tammy Hearman, and um, she was just one of those really lovable leaders to watch because she was super smart, and her super smarts always came out as helping people understand what they could do rather than telling them what they should do. And so a really lovable leader for me opens your horizons to what's possible, what could be, and stays very far away from telling you what you should do. Um, that's, that's lovable to me. I think that's fantastic. So thank you again for coming to my book launch and for sharing your brilliance. Thank you so much. You know what a I heard, work it is. I heard Jess encouraging you on future books. And, and as someone who I leave six years between my books because I know what a Herculean effort it is both to write it, but also to do this work and get yes. it to its audience. So I'm just going to enjoy the lovable leader. Take a breath. Before, cool. <laughs> before I will. And, and that's helpful for me too, because I have a tendency to accomplish, move on to next thing, accomplish, move on to next thing. And this is the one where I'm really trying hard to just appreciate this, take a pause, take a breath, let it land, let it be a thing that exists out there and not steal its thunder by releasing another book after it. Exactly. Yeah. So I'll take my time. Thank you for that. Thank you for coming on. I really appreciate you. Thanks so much, Jeff. Bye-bye. See you. Bye.